Thank you. So I'm going to be discussing mostly 3D printing technologies and its use in spine surgery. Um, so I think we all understand that um, the spine is a complex three-dimensional structure. Each patient is uh, an individual, yet our preoperative planning uh, is predominantly based on two-dimensional imaging. Um, and beyond our preoperative planning, our uh, implants for specific pathologies um, are very standardized. And um, oftentimes, we have difficult cases that really need something a little bit more customized than what's available kind of off the shelf. So when we're talking about 3D uh, printing and its use in spine care, there's really kind of three areas where there's been a good amount of literature uh, using models, templates, and implants. So what do we mean by 3D printing? Uh, it's a form of additive manufacturing. Typical machining is a subtractive form of manufacturing where you create uh, 3D parts by cutting away a solid block of material versus 3D printing is an additive layer by layer printing a 3D structure. Um, and so the basic idea is that you, know, you start with a large block of material with subtractive um, manufacturing. You remove um, and then you end up with waste and your 3D object versus in uh, 3D printing, you have kind of the opposite where you start with a smaller amount of basic material and then you can create a complex three-dimensional structure with less waste. So why don't we do this all the time? Technology constraints and cost. Um, but that being said, those things are changing. Um, and uh, basically, you can use a variety of different printing materials, uh, metals, plastic, ceramics, even human cells, and print extremely complex three-dimensional structures, uh, just layer on layer. Uh, to the point where there's been thoughts of um, printing um, turbines uh, for jet engines um, in terms of the complexity of what can be done. And then in terms of the materials, there's actually reports of uh, 3D printing uh, human structures out of cells. So in terms of spine, though, we're a little bit behind that. Uh, but um, there has been the idea of using three-dimensional models for preoperative planning has been around for a while. This is a, one of the first kind of um, publications really describing it in detail from 2007, where they basically took complex deformity cases, um, they made three-dimensional models, and then used surveys to discuss with the physicians kind of how much um, did the model help. Um, and so in about 65% of the cases, they thought that the 3D model preoperatively um, allowed them to understand the uh, anatomic features better than just the CT or the MRI. And in 11% of cases, they actually uh, reported that there were anatomic details that could not be seen on two-dimensional imaging. So um, that's pretty important from that stam standpoint, from a planning standpoint. Uh, the next step is uh, we kind of looked at our use of 3D models intraoperatively for screw placement. Um, and so uh, this is for my fellowship. We had 513 screws placed in 23 consecutive patients. Uh, and what we found is every patient got an intraoperative O-arm spin. And these are really only for the most complex deformities that we really went out of our way to uh, make a 3D uh, printed model. And 2.1% uh, of the screws after the O-arm spin required uh, repositioning. And there were no complications directly related to the screw placement. So this is kind of an example of the type of case where a 3D model can be really helpful. Um, obviously, in two planes, it's really difficult to tell what's going on. And even these computerized 3D models that you can spin around, it doesn't really give you a full fit picture of exactly what's going on. And so when you can, you can print out this 3D model, you can mark where your instrumentation points are going to be. You can draw where your osteotomy cuts are going to be and then put this in a sterile bag, bring it into the operating room, and you can just match the anatomy bone for bone, uh, exact, so you can get your starting points exactly where you want them to be. You can cut the bone exactly what you had planned. Um, and uh, basically, that, that was kind of how we used that. So then the next kind of step was um, taking the information from the 3D printed model and then creating uh, 3D printed patient-specific templates. Um, so instead of marking it and kind of looking and freehanding, uh, this group kind of created a templates that they could fit to the lamina uh, and spinous process and then um, place the screw 
uh, through a template, and so a uh, large cohort, and they showed very good results, uh, similar to what we see with navigation or robotics. Um, and so basically they plan uh, on preoperative imaging, uh, the trajectory, then print templates, and then the template allows for placement of the starting point, the drill, and then finally instrumentation through three separate templates. So basically the starting point template, a drill template, and then a screw placement template um, were created uh, within this study. And you can kind of see the sequence of how um, this can be helpful. Now, this is a lot of printing to be done for each screw. Um, and so uh, it can get costly. And with kind of our navigation technology where it is right now, may not. Um, I'm not sure this is going to be as helpful, but maybe in places where we don't have um, uh, the type of navigation technology that's available in most centers now in the United States. So then the next kind of step is, what about permanent implants? Um, so in neurosurgery, we've been putting in custom implants for decades um, after uh, hemicraniectomies for cranioplasties. They're safe, they're effective, but the biologic demands um, and physiologic demands on a um, on a cranioplasty plate aren't quite the same as what we're dealing with in the spine. I think for that reason, it hadn't really um, picked up steam until more recently, um, but uh, it certainly has. So sin uh, since 2016 was the first published re report of a 3D printed implant used for spine surgery. Uh, since then, there have been 23 papers, a uh, total of 197 published uh, patients. Um, the vast majority of the are using 3D printed titanium, um, and uh, the majority of the publications are related to um, custom uh, implants, though there are some cases, two case series using off-the-shelf implants, and we'll discuss why 3D printing of um, non-custom implants may be helpful as well. So the idea behind a custom implant and 3D printing for that is pretty um, intuitive. You know, um, sometimes we have anatomy that's just difficult to reconstruct with a mesh cage or um, screws alone, right? So um, creating a custom um, implant uh, can allow for um, uh, something that fits exactly into your planned defect and, uh, you know, and a final kind of um, uh, implant kind of that looks much better than kind of what we had in the past. So why even, so why printing off the shelf implants that are using 3D printing? So there's a couple things in terms of the complex 3D structure that you can create with 3D printing that um, you just can't really uh, create with uh, classic machining uh, or casting um, to create uh, an implant. And so um, though you can't, you know, uh, change uh, the modulus of elasticity of titanium, you can, you can create pores in a three-dimensional structure that can change the overall stiffness of the, of the construct itself. And there have been biomechanical studies showing that you can actually change the three-dimensional structure of titanium so that it can have um, a uh, modulus of uh, elasticity similar to peak. Um, and, um, but you then also get to keep the benefits of having a biologically inert titanium, which may help prevent osteolysis that can sometimes be associated with peak implants. Um, on top of that, you can create a, a rich and complex internal architecture uh, with pores can be uh, incorporated into titanium, which may help allow for bony ingrowth. And so, um, oh. In terms of our, uh, in terms of porosity, there's a lot of uh, orthopedics literature kind of showing that these small um, pores within an implant actually allow um, the osteoblast to grow into the implant and get incorporated into the fusion. And you can do this with a 3T, with a 3D printed porous titanium alloy. And this is a study uh, in an animal model, um, basically compared um, three different types of implants: a pure peak implant. Uh, a titanium coated peak implant, and then a 3D printed porous titanium implant. And so the 3D printed porous titanium implant basically outperformed uh, the peak and titanium coated peak in terms of um, bony ingrowth, growth, uh, range of motion at final follow up or at sacrifice, and then also CT um, uh, evaluation of fusion. So 
this is a histologic kind of example from this study of exactly what we're talking about. And um, so the peak, what you can see is there, though there is kind of bone growing through the graft and the holes of the graft, um, you can see that the, the actual implant isn't really being incorporated at all. And even in the titanium case, it's though you don't have the osteolysis, you still, it's not truly getting incorporated versus in this porous uh, titanium 3D printed model, there's um, increased um, incorporation of the implant itself. And then I include this from this study because it's a little bit of a meta slide because this is the, in order to show um, the CT efficacy of the 3D printed implant, they did 3D prints of the CT scan, um, basically showing uh, bone growth uh, on CT. So uh, in terms of clinical studies beyond that, there's, there's really only two cohorts that have come out um, kind of looking at um, 3D printed implants and their utilization clinically. And like most uh, retrospective clinical cohorts, it basically showed that it always works and it always fuses and there's never any complications. Um, so uh, that being said, we're, we're probably not going to get a randomized controlled trial um, anytime soon. There is one currently enrolling patients. Uh, but results are not expected till 2022. And um, basically, industry, from an industry standpoint, there's no need for a randomized control trial for FDA approval for these, so we're probably not going to get one. Um, and, um, but what we do have is that there are certainly issues with this. So you have the medical device reported. Um, uh, reports for any sort of new implant, any uh, uh, issues related to them. And so uh, the 3D printed um, implants, because of their porosity and all these um, things that we're trying to make it more like bone, there, there are reports of fragility fractures associated with them. Um, and 19 reported cases to date, um, uh, including the cage breaking into multiple pieces. Uh, or even that the cage collapsed in situ. So we certainly see a lot of like uh, end plate fractures and things like that from interbody fusions, but um, up until 3D you know, printed cages, I don't think anyone's heard of the actual cage itself collapsing. So um, this is kind of a representative case, and um, thank you. <laughs>